It's just going to bouncy. So how are you doing? How's Comic Con been? It's been wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody that's come and said hello. And um, everyone's been so brilliantly friendly. And these, these things are always such a celebration of such positive attitudes. And um, it's a joy for me. I'm overwhelmed by it. So thank you, everybody. And in terms of fandoms, because you are part of quite a few. You're a few, yeah. When you're meeting fans at Comic Cons, what are they responding to the most? What do you get asked about the most? The Buttercup Cough Syrup commercial from 1996. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, well, you know, it, it's always different things, really. Everybody has a different, you know, whether it's Star Trek or, um, or Star Wars or, or the Cornetto films or, or Dark Crystal recently. Um, or something obscure, you know, um, you, you never know what you're going to get. And people have different loves and different, um, are in different fandoms. So I'm, I'm open to anything. You can see I'm a bit of a whore in that respect, uh, <laughs> franchise-wise. Do you have a favorite out of all the franchises, may I? Uh, it's very difficult to say. I'm very, obviously very attached to Star Trek because I got to write one of those. Um, playing the Chamberlain in, this, in the Dark Crystal was an incredible opportunity because when I left... The cinema in 1982, I think, was it? Confirm or deny? Um, the Chamberlain was the character that I remembered the most. Mm -hmm. And I left the cinema going, mm -hmm, like this. <laughs> and, and, and to get offered that role was an extraordinary thing. And that's happened to me so many times in terms of playing Scotty or being uh, in Star Wars or whatever, to, to, to become part of the things that I loved so much as, as a child, you know, and Doctor Who as well. Um, it's a really weird, there's a lots of strange circularities in my life whereby I've been, you know, a fan of something as, as a young person and become that thing in later life. I owned the fucking Millennium Falcon for a little while back there, you know, <laughs> it was in my junkyard. It was mine. I was on the logbook of the Millennium Falcon and that's crazy. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and also being the engineer on the Starship Enterprise, that's two major spaceships that I've had in my care, you know. So for a nerd like me, <laughs> fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I feel exactly how you would feel in that position. It's very strange. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about space. Any yeah. space fans here? <laughs> just, just a few, quite a few. Um, Jessica Hines, you wrote this with her. Uh, she's incredible. Yes, she What is. was it like back then writing with her and how did you meet? Well, we were just kind of a couple of... 20-somethings who we'd been in a show together that Edgar Wright had directed on the Paramount Comedy Channel. And Jess and I had known each other for a little while. And the, someone asked us if we wanted to have our own show, you know, which was very lucky back in the day. This is before digital television. Uh, it was just Channel 4 and ITV and BBC2 and BBC1. And um, Jess and I were like, yeah, sure, okay, but we want to write it in a really sort of arrogant way. And they, they, they said, okay. And, and seemingly at every corner we were given permission to go forward with this show. And eventually we, you know, we got it on Channel 4. We, we got Edgar into direct because he was the only person who we felt could visualize what we had in mind writing-wise. And that's absolutely true. Um, and then, um, and it just sort of happened. And we were so lucky in every way to get that show made. I'm very proud of it. And it's 20 years old this year. So happy birthday, Spaced. <laughs> yeah. And there are, there are people that have come up um, for signings and stuff who are space fans who weren't born <laughs> when it came out, which is just so bizarre. And such a nice kind of, um, you know, it's so lovely that people are still discovering it now. So thank you if you, if you have just come to it late. Thank you. Tim in the show was very much an extension of you, you said. And you very much wore his geek heart on his sleeve and yeah. all those set pieces that you, you filmed, those crazy moments like the Resident Evil thing. And yeah. What would Tim be like today? Do you think 20 years on? Tim now works on, he, he works at Pinewood on the new Star Wars movies, uh, designing um, spaceships and things. That's his job now. He's a graphic designer. He left the comic book industry. Um, he was a big fan of The Force Awakens because he worked on that. He didn't like The Last Jedi so much for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but he's very much looking forward to The Rise of Skywalker. Um, him, and, him and Daisy married for a while. They had one child. Uh, then they divorced, and um, Brian died. Um, <laughs> but his work became incredibly appreciated after his posthumous death. And then they discovered that he faked his death uh, just so he'd become famous. Um, Mike married his boyfriend of 12 years, and um, they settled down together. And uh, Twist uh, is missing in action. 
I say you don't ever need to see another space station. Oh, and Marsha still lives in the house. Okay, there we go. Um, you mentioned Edgar, Edgar Wright. Yeah. And you've worked with Edgar and Nick Frost, obviously, many times. What is it that's so enjoyable about working with those two? Well, I mean, Nick, I've known for 25 years and he's my best friend, you know, and so any time we get to work together is great because we get to hang out together. Um, and similarly, Edgar, I met when I was very young and starting out. So when I get to work with Edgar and Nick, I'm working with two very close friends um, and it's just a lot of fun. And we have a we have a rhythm, you know, that Nick and I tend to do all the kind of front of house sort of keeping everybody happy. Edgar becomes incredibly intense because he's such a, I mean, he's, he's such a perfectionist that he, we give him the space to become angry and beard stroking. And, um, and, but we have a lot of fun, you know, and I, and I can't wait to do the next thing together, which we will do at some point. How have they changed from when you met them as younger guys back then to now? Like, how have they changed? Divas. Really? Both. Who's the biggest diva of all? Oh, Nick Frost is the biggest <laughs> diva on earth. He's terrible. If you don't get him a latte by 8 a.m., he literally has a shit fit. <laughs> so let's move on to the Cornetto trilogy, because I think there's a few Cornetto trilogy fans out here as well. <laughs> um, I like it when you cheer the lights just go up and then they go down again. <laughs> and you're gone. <laughs> um, tell me, you know, the, oh, those were your first feature films. That was your first foray into that vibe. Yeah. What were those first days of shooting like? Were you like shit scared? Well, on Sean, it was like we didn't really know if it would ever get a release, let alone, you know, um, what, what it would become. Um, so it was just kind of fun, you know, it was just like making space, but, but slightly different, you know, we were making a movie, so it was a different dynamic. Mm. When we came to do Hot Fuzz, we, we knew we had to kind of back up what we'd done initially. Mm. And um, so that was a little bit more sort of, okay, we need to get our game faces on here. And then with The World's End, we were just happy to be making the final film in the trilogy, you know. We'd always wanted to make three, and um, it was really exciting to come back having sort of laid the groundwork with Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz to make The World's End, which is kind of my favorite of the three, just because it's probably the most personal and the most grown up, I think. It's almost like as much a drama as it is a comedy, The World's End. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it, it was, it, it, every one of them, you know, they have their highlights and their moments. Um, yeah, I, it's really hard to pick them apart in terms of making them. Hot Fuzz was a lot of research for me. I had to go, we went out with the police. I did a lot of, you know, sort of ride-alongs and stuff. Sean was kind of me uh, at 25 or whatever. Uh, Nicholas Angel was not me at all. <laughs> yeah. Gary King, you know, there were bits of me and Gary King, but um, so Nicholas took the, the most research. With Gary King, I, I watched an interview with you online where you mentioned that was one of your favorite roles to play why is it why is it that role is one of your favorites because he's such a dick <laughs> what's it like play? i've always wondered that you know as an actor like because sometimes i have these moments you know where i cut and i'm like beating someone over the head with a tennis racket like, you <laughs> dickhead you slow walking idiot like, is it quite a release to play someone who's yeah you know? it's nice to play characters that have things going on underneath you know so with someone like gary you know he's kind of He's so bombastic and annoying and frenetic, but underneath he's, he's in incredible pain, you know, and he's, he's, he's incredibly complex and, and, and sympathetic. And it was fun to play a character who was incredibly annoying for the most part. But then you realize that he's a suicidal alcoholic on a death mission, you know, and it's kind of, oh, I see now, I get it. And, but you have to play that part of him throughout the whole movie before that's revealed. So as an actor, it was just the chewiest of all the roles. Do you ever take any kind of roles home with you and you think, oh, I need to get in your, your wife might go, hello, <laughs> like remember where you are? No, I'm not really a method actor in that respect. I did have to get very, very skinny for a job I did this year and my wife was, was in tears about that because I kind of got down to sort of skin and bone. I saw the picture. Yeah, and um, so she wasn't that happy about that. But otherwise, she, she's, she always grounds me. She stops me from being a sort of head in the clouds actor prick. Um, as soon as I get home, I'm picking up the dog shit in the courtyard. There's no sort of, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm home now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Although I do have a courtyard, which is uh, <laughs> prickish to say the least. Get into the courtyard and pick <laughs> up that poo. Um, Mission Impossible is another big franchise you're part of. You play Benji. Yeah. Uh, what was that call from J.J. Abrams like when you picked up and he went, right? I, I was writing Hot Fuzz at the time, weirdly, and, and there was a, like, we were at a big talk productions where uh, Edgar and I wrote the, the Cornetto films 
and the phone rang and someone said, oh, it's J.J. Abrams for you. And I was like, what, like alias J.J., who he was then. He'd, he'd only done alias in Felicity. And uh, I got on the phone and he said, hey, man, it's J.J., like I knew him. And, um, and he asked me to do Mission Impossible 3. And he'd seen Shaun of the Dead and he'd seen me and Edgar at the Saturn Awards, but hadn't come up to say hello because <laughs> he was nervous, he said, ridiculously. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, then, then I went over and I did Mission Impossible 3. And, um, and similarly, since then, I've been offered roles by JJ via email um, in various degrees of, because he just goes straight to you. He doesn't do the whole agent thing. So I literally have an email somewhere that says, do you want to play Scotty? Which I got off the back of a flight from New York and I turned my phone on and it, it, it just came through. And I was so disgusted because I was like, how can you say that without some kind of dinner or wine or some sort of <laughs> sexual favor first, you know? It doesn't seem as grand. I can't just say, <laughs> yeah, you know, to that email. I can't just reply, sure. Because it, it, happy face. Yeah, it felt, <laughs> it felt so ridiculously huge. It took me like three days to say yes because, and he's like, what, do you want it or not? And I'm like, I don't know. This is huge. You know, you're asking me to play Scotty. And um, so, of course, I said yes eventually. And then similarly with, you know, we went out to dinner um, before he started shooting The Force Awakens. And he said, do, would you like to play a, bo- a blobfish in Star Wars? And I was like, yeah, okay. Uh, and also he told me, has everyone seen The Force Awakens, right? Okay, so spoiler alert. He said, literally, over dinner, he went, oh, by the way, we're killing Han. And I'm like a Star Wars fan from the 1977. And I was like, you can't just fucking say that over dinner. <laughs> You've just killed someone I love over sushi, you prick. Um, but um, yeah, so that was, that was um, he, he, he's such a wonderful guy, JJ. He's such a, a, a brilliant, beautiful man. And he's been responsible for so many sort of wish come true moments for me in my life, you know, not, not just things like that, but also, you know, he brought me in to listen to John Williams recording the soundtrack for The Force Awakens. So to listen, as someone who listened to the Empire Strikes Back double album as a kid, imagining myself in Star Wars, to be sat there listening to him play the Han and Leia suite from The Empire Strikes Back. And I mean, it was... It I was, had a little tear in my eye. I did have a tear in my eye. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, that's like a bit of a oh, sort yeah. of moment. But you also co-wrote... Star Trek Beyond. I did, yes. Um, with Doug uh, Young. Now, as a fan of Star Trek and then going into writing, was there something from a fan perspective you wanted to insert into that script? Yes. Well, Doug and I, Doug came over to the UK when we wrote Star Trek Beyond and we wanted to try and make the film as much for the fans of Star Trek, the people that have been with Star Trek since, since September 1966 um, up until now. And so we would, we would write and then we'd go and we'd watch episodes of the original series and we'd take down the names of red shirts and crew people so that we could put them into the script in strange places. I think the two people that get murdered by Kral at the end are the two crew members that get married in an episode which I can't remember the name of. Somebody out there will know it. Um, thank you. And uh, so little things like that. But we wanted to make it like a big, long episode. So it was kind of self-contained and brought it back slightly to the spirit of the series. It was the 50th anniversary. Yeah. And um, it was important to us to make a, a film that felt like an episode of Star Trek. I think there'd been a little bit, you know, um, Into Darkness is, was quite divisive in terms of um, its appeal. And I think we wanted to make something with, with, with Beyond that just felt very, very much like Star Trek, very much in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the vein of the original series. And also by pairing up Bones and Spock and Kirk and, and Chekhov and me and Jayla, um, you know, and also uh, with uh, uh, Sulu and Uhura. It was odd pairings and, you know, um, we just wanted to mix it up a bit. It was such, a, it was such an honor to be given the keys to that car. Yes, yeah. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Thank you. I used to watch it with my mum. Yeah, me too. That's how I got into sci-fi. Yeah. That and the X-Files. Um, there's a huge wave of nostalgia at the moment. Maybe it's because of the generation buying all this stuff. I'm not sure, but we've got it. Yeah. We've got Stranger Things. It's like that steeped in the 80s culture. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Star Wars, Star Trek. Why do you think there's this wave of nostalgia coming back? I think it's got something to do with the fact that unlike... Well, certainly my parents, um, 
this generation, our generations, the millennials, anybody since who was born after sort of 1970, has had a sort of extension to their youth um, in that we haven't been required to grow up quite as fast as we did back then. The war years, even post-war in the 50s and 60s when there was still rationing going on, people grew up a lot sooner. They got married a lot earlier. They became adults a lot earlier. I look back at my dad when he was 30 and he seems older than me now and I'm 50 next year. So I think we're all a little bit younger for longer. And I think all the, the kids that grew up buying Star Wars figures and being into all these, these properties like Marvel Comics, they're all grown-ups now, and they're all having a say about what forms the cultural landscape. So they're basically recreating their own childhoods and making that the mainstream. So I think the reason we're seeing all these things coming back is because the people that are making it are the children of those shows and films, you know? Mm -hmm. J.J., I think his dad was a producer on the original Star Trek film, and, you know, he remembers going to see Star Wars as a kid. And now that he own, runs that particular world, it's, it's, it's no coincidence that he was a child at that time. I like the fact, I think now, as an adult, um, that nerd culture is quite big. Because when I was younger, we had this chat upstairs. Yeah. I said that I was like a sort of slightly rotund, sad girl, writing sad girl poetry in my room. Yeah. Thinking I could draw like Jim Lee. Yeah. I was like, I can do it. I can be a comic book artist. Yeah. But I didn't have a place like MCM. You know, do you think now it's kind of cool to be a nerd or a geek? I think, so. yeah, it's, it's very nice for us that it's become this kind of thing. Yeah. I'm not so naive as to suggest there aren't market forces at work behind all this and who don't necessarily have all of our you know, best interests at heart. There's a, it's been monetized and it's become the mainstream, but at the same time, it's really cool you know, that this can all be uh, enjoyed on such a big level. I love the way that this world brings people like us all together and creates such a sense of belonging and unity. People can dress as their favorite characters and, and, and walk around without fear of being like people taking the piss because fuck those guys, do you know what I mean? The people that kind of think that way aren't welcome here. They are actually, everyone's welcome here, what am I saying? But I just think it's very, very cool that, that we have this platform now. If this had been like this when I was a kid, I mean, the toys now, the toys that are being made are all the things that I wish I had yep. when I was young. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The day that my Star Wars figure arrived, my Uncar Plot Star Wars figure arrived, I could quite happily have just retired and <laughs> disappeared forever. Because it was like, I have my own Star Wars figure now. That's insane. And um, What does your daughter think of that? Would she's you... cool. She's here, actually. My daughter's over here. She's dressed as Junko Anishima from uh, My Hero Academia. Um... She won't let you wave till. Stand, hey, oh, stand up, stand up, stand up. Go on. Oh, you're there she is, there she is. Woo! Round of applause. You look amazing. She did entirely her own cosplay, um, and she's amazing at it. Um, you're doing the embarrassing dad. I am. I'm so, such an embarrassing dad. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there she is. Stand up. Look at her. Everybody. <laughs> uh, sorry, sweetheart. Um, <laughs> That'll come back in 10, 15 years' time. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> um, I wanted to actually ask a good segue here. How do you keep up with uh, pop culture now? Does your daughter keep you up to date with the latest thing? Yeah, absolutely. Like, in terms of certain things, my sister, who's also here, Katie Pegg over there, uh, she... Uh, <laughs> Embarrassing and my brother, brother. My Embarrassing dad. <laughs> um, she, she uh, Tilly and Kate uh, always sort of, like, kept me uh, up abreast of things like the X-Files when I was, you know, when I was becoming a little bit older and invested in work. Uh, but in terms of nowadays, yeah, Tilly's got me into the whole anime thing. She's a big anime fan. So I've been able to go up to people at the festival and at the, at the con and just sort of tap them on the back and say, hey, nice, uh, nice froppy. And, um, and see them go, oh, like that, which is funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she, she keeps me informed. Now, in Ready Player One, you play Ogden Morrow. Mm -hmm. um, oh, woo! <laughs> and you get to see yourself as an old man. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, what are you going to be like as an actual old man? <laughs> That's a random question. Creepy. <laughs> that creepy old guy at the con. <laughs> creepy old guy walking around the Comic Con. No, there, were, there will be, I mean, you know, in, in the years to come, these, these things will be full of all. It's like snowboarding. I love snowboarding, and nowadays you're seeing more and more old snowboarders because it's a, a relatively young culture, but it's been around a while. Same as con culture now, you see lots of older cosplayers, which is lovely. Um, I don't know, I think I'll hopefully be a cool sort of 
guy, I guess. I, I, I'm still in touch with what I love and where I'm from and, you know. Ask your daughter that in 20 years. Sir. Yeah, I did that, I did that <laughs> face app thing, um, you know, that makes you look old. It's a really good app and it does a really good job of making you look old. And uh, I look pretty cool, you know, a bit of, <laughs> bit of gray hair and stuff. Um, you're uh, working with Nick Frost again on Truth Seekers. Yes. And so this is your return to TV with Nick after Since Space. Uh-huh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, about Truth Seekers. Truth Seekers is a, a show we're doing for Amazon, which is a, um, a sort of um, uh, paranormal investigation kind of uh, sitcom, I guess. Um, although it's single camera, it's not like a traditional sitcom. Um, it's not actually me and Nick as the ghost hunters. I play Nick's boss. I mean, it's slightly less because it was a sort of a, a, a scheduling thing. Um, but Nick heads up this team of ghost hunters um, who are essentially satellite installation um, kind of engineers and ghost hunters. And um, it's, it's a really interesting, fun kind of um, case of the week mixed in with a big story arc. We've got amazing people in it. Malcolm McDowell's in it, um, you know, who is just an absolute legend and a lovely guy. Uh, Julian Barrett. We've got some fantastic guest stars and uh, a brilliant young cast. And so I'm very excited for that to come out. Now, um, I asked online uh, on Instagram and Twitter for some questions. Oh, God. Here. And, oh, here we go. <laughs> I chose some good ones. Don't worry. I've got this first question from Pia Middleton on Instagram. Oh. This is, I want to know as well because uh, I'm quite interested in this. What is your favorite Cornetto flavor? Mint. Yes. 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 Big up the mints. Big up the mints. Any mint fans? Yeah. I feel we're a rare breed. I know. I don't see the originals <laughs> around so much anymore. The strawberries and the mints seem to be very popular. I used to be a raspberry, ripply, strawberry person. I moved to mint. Yeah, I like mint because I, I like, like the it. chocolate on the mint. It's nice yes. and crunchy. Oh, yes. Uh, Ronan.clapham on Instagram. If you got the chance to play any part in any film you haven't starred in, what would it be? Oh, my God. I would love to have played... H.I. McDonough in uh, Raising Arizona, right. uh, which I would never have been able to play as well as Nicolas Cage. For me, it's his finest performance, um, which is saying something because he's an amazing actor. But that film for me and Edgar was a key movie in our sort of evolution as, as comedy filmmakers just because it taught us that you, it isn't just the script that's funny with a movie, you, you, and particularly with Edgar, you know, you can make jokes with a camera move and you can make jokes in terms of how the film is directed, which has been key to Edgar's sort of, you know, uh, style. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that would have been fun to play that role. Last one for the fans, and then we're going to play a game. Ooh. Okay. So this is from Twitter, shiny01390976. I know them well. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have any plans to return to the West End? Uh... No plans, but I'd love to do some theatre. That would be great. The last time I was in the West End was with Steve Coogan's live show in 1998, so 21 years ago. But, yeah, I, I haven't done theatre as much as I thought I would when I was young. I kind of um, loved all that stuff when I was a drama student, but, you know, life took a different way. But, um, yeah, that would be fun. Watch this space. Watch this space. No, you play Scotty in Star Trek, I and do. you have a Scottish wife. I do. I am also Scottish. I know. So you. I'm making this game Scottish. Okay. My <laughs> Scottish mother-in-law is here as well. Who isn't Ooh. here with me today is the question. <laughs> so this is the Scottish phrase challenge. Oh, okay. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to go with Scottish accents, but I didn't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> There's many of them. So yeah. the first um, word, and I just say what comes into your head straight away. Okay. You, I'll say the, the word or the phrase. You just say what you think it is. Okay, go. Okay, you ready? I've yep. got an image on the screen so you can see how it's spelled. Oaksters. Oaksters is your armpits. Yes. <laughs> Round of applause, that's hard. It's these areas. <laughs> Oaksters. Right, okay. The next one is... We have the next one. Peely Wally. Peely Wally? I have no idea. Oh, can you take a guess? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peely Wally means pale or sickly. Oh, you're looking a bit peely Wally. Yeah. Do you know that, Big Mo? Yeah? Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. Peely Wally. <laughs> right, the next one, let's get the next one up. Hodge your weast. Hodge your weast, I mean, shut up. Very good, very well done. I get that a lot from my wife. <laughs> Hodge your weast. <laughs> and take out the, get the poo out of the courtyard. Um, okay, yeah. the next one, the next one. Glake it. Glake it. Oh, that's if you're feeling a bit sick, isn't it? No, no. Glick it. You you use that one. 
What is it? It means uh, stupid. Stupid. Oh, yeah, a bit like it. Like it. Stupid. Yeah, a bit like it there. Right, okay, <laughs> next one. The next one is get loudy. Get loudy. Oh, that just means get into it. Give yeah. it your best shot. Yeah. Do it. Get it loudy, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, the next one is, it's pure Baltic. It's pure Baltic. That's, it means it's cold. Yes, very well done. It's that's, very cold. That's an easy one. Yeah. And the last one is, it's my favorite, bolt your rocket. Bolt your rocket. Fuck off. Yeah, get lost after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bolt your rocket. Bolt your rocket. Very well, well done. Not too bad, not too bad. <laughs> not bad at all. Right now, we have time for fan questions. We have a mic here, and we have a mic here. So see where the stewards are standing. If you have a question, oh, oh, so this, this little guy here oh, right. like crashed. Right, where's the, the left-hand side is always so slow. Come on, get, come on, get, get, get. It's the other side of the brain. It's not as, uh, not as fast. Not as fast. Right, because since you almost knocked down our lovely stewards to get to Simon, <laughs> so we'll start with you first. Go for it. Um, if you haven't played a superhero role yet, so if you could play any superhero, which one would you do? Well, last time I answered this question, it kind of caused an internet rumor, which I, because I said Captain Britain, because <laughs> <laughs> not just because I am from Britain, but because I used to get the Incredible Hulk weekly when I was a kid, which was a Marvel UK publication. And I think the first edition came free with a Captain Britain mask. And I remember Brian Braddock and, and that character from Marvel, and I used to read that in Marvel Comics when I was a kid. So it felt like the most obvious one. So I guess, I think I'm a bit, I'm getting on a bit now. Unless they do like a kind of Hank Pym thing, you know, and there's like old Brian Braddock and they get some handsome young guy to play the new Captain Britain. I'll be old Captain Britain. But yeah, I guess him. Do you know what I mean? That feels like the one closest to my comic book affections. Thank you very much for your Who are you dressed as? Mad-Eyed Moody. Mad-Eyed Moody, I knew it. I could see, I don't have my glasses on, so I couldn't quite make it out. I could just see your eye. <laughs> you look great, and thank hey, you What are you, much. fizz gigs, sky, cyclops? I don't know, anyway. Thank you. Over to the left side. Hi. Go for it. What's your favorite memory of working on space? Oh, man, I think the first time Jess and I walked into the flat at 23 Meteor Street, which was a set at Tw Twickenham Studios, and um, Ealing, I think, for season two, and it was... Just having written the show and then writing vague details about the flat and then walking in and having this, you know, the production designers create it all. And it was the first time we realized that we were making a sitcom and it was quite, quite extraordinary just to sort of to be in our world that we've made. So, yeah, that was definitely that moment. Thank, Thank you so very much. much. Thank you. Next. Uh, I've got one short one and a quick long one, if that's all right. I mean, one short one and a quick long one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like that's my Saturday night. Okay. <laughs> Let, let's, let's try your short one. Go for it. Okay. Um, could you imagine what would happen if Nick and Gary and Sean all met at the same time? I like the idea of doing like a video game where you get all those characters together. Um, I think Nicholas Angel would arrest Gary King immediately. <laughs> uh, I think Ed and Danny would get on very well. Uh, Sean would be very uh, suspicious of Nicholas Angel and probably think Gary's quite cool. I think they, they would probably be an interesting sort of uh, pub episode. Um, I don't think there'd be too much violence as such, but it would definitely end with Gary King in prison. <laughs> uh, when you dream of being all in all those franchises like Star Wars and Star Trek and when you finally got the job, did you feel like, oh my God, this is amazing, but also at the same time you're like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? Like, now I know how Nimoy feels. <laughs> no, I, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was a joy to give up the pleasure of seeing those films, you know, as a fan, just to be in them, because to, to put on that uniform in Star Trek or to, to be on Jakku in, in, in The Force Awakens and see all that around me was, was, was amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I never, ever take those opportunities for granted, so I'll, I'll meet them head on with great enthusiasm. So, yeah, I mean, it was very funny. I remember me and Chris Pine being sat in a trailer with Leonard one night when we were shooting the stuff on, on um, the planet where Spock and Kirk discover me. Um, and Leonard was in his 80s, I think, at the time, and he fell asleep and started to snore. And um, he was sat upright. And Chris and I were suddenly in a room with Spock from Star Trek, actual Spock, from Star Trek, snoring. <laughs> and we were just looking at each other. We didn't want to wake him up because he's Leonard Nimoy. And just looking at each other with the biggest kind of WTF faces I've ever pulled in my life, as Spock himself was like... 
with his ears and everything. But um, no, never regret it. Never regret it. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> next question. Okay. Uh, hi, Simon. Uh, if hi. you were to write the next season of Dark Crystal, yeah. what would you have the Chamberlain do? Ooh. Everything. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I love playing that character. And, it, you know, he, he's such a scheming... He's kind of like uh, Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. You know, he's just sort of in everything. Um, so just more of that stuff, more of that manipulation. You know, he thinks everyone is beneath him, you know, even the Emperor. And I think that uh, playing that character is so fun. He's a Machiavellian dream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely lady here. Hello, Simon. Hi. It's so nice to meet you. You too. Um, you've, you've done a lot of amazing Hollywood A-list these years, but also you are loved by, by us for um, independent series and films. So my question is, what would you say is your most underrated film or the film that you wish that more people could see? Oh, that's interesting. That's a good question. I think probably there's two films like that. One of them is The Fantastic Fear of Everything, which I did with Crispy and Mills, which is a strange little curio of a movie. And the other one is a film called Hector and the Search for Happiness, which was, so uh, thank you, which was a really fun film to make. And... Um, It's a very sort of, it's very, it's very fabulistic and it's quite sort of broad in its view of the world, but the whole thing is sort of seen from a child's point of view because Hector is kind of like a child in a man's body. And um, I think that was mistaken for naivety on the part of the filmmakers yeah. when it came out. But uh, yeah, it's a sweet film. If you get a chance, give it a look. You've seen it, obviously. Yeah. I love it so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Next. Hi, Simon. Hi. Um, oh. Uh, I absolutely love space. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, very poignant for the time at my age. Brilliant. Thank Did you, you ever consider going back to writing TV and maybe, maybe not the same, but... Yeah, what well, we're doing right now, you know, television has changed so much since space and now it's become, you know, as, as screens have evolved and um, we've all got cinema screens in our houses now, our televisions are you know, 16 by nine, the right ratio. TV is no longer the poorer cousin of film, you know? And a lot of really exciting things are happening in television now. And a lot of great actors are, are finding the most interesting roles are on TV. So absolutely, uh, Nick and I started a production company called Stolen Picture. And the next few things that I'm sort of involved with creating are based for television. So 100%, it's become this incredibly fertile playground and I'm, I'm excited to get back into it. Nice, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay, we've got little Sean here. Hello, little Sean. Hello. Um, before my question, I just want to say that I've just started college and I'm doing filmmaking and media and the Cornetto trilogy is a huge reason why I'm so interested in films. So I just want to oh. say thank you for that. No, my pleasure. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just think they're so clever and brilliant. Bless you. Um, but my question is, is there any sort of story or reason behind why a Cornetto is the reason that all the films are tied together? Was there any sort of yes. anecdote behind that? Absolutely. Uh, we, uh, Ed, it was Edgar's idea to put a strawberry cornetto in Shaun of the Dead because it had been used as a hangover cure at some point by a friend of his. Um, at the premiere of Shaun of the Dead, we got free cornettos. <laughs> We'd never been given anything, anything quite as amazing as free cornettos before. <laughs> and we thought if we put them in hot fuzz, we might get free cornettos again. Um, <laughs> So as a reference to Shaun of the Dead, in a very self-indulgent way, we put the Cornetto into, um, into Hot Fuzz. We didn't get free Cornettos at the premiere, which was a bummer. But as we were doing the press for Shaun of the Dead, I'm so sorry for Hot Fuzz, people picked up on it. And Edgar and I were just going, yeah, it's part of a trilogy we're doing. And we started to bullshit this whole thing about, you know, <laughs> the Cornetto trilogy. So when it came to write The World's End, there had to be a moment in The World's End when there was a Cornetto, which occurs at the end. Um, And so that was it. It was a complete accident, but it felt like a nice way of tying the three films together because they're thematically linked anyway. They're kind of all about mm. the individual versus the, um, the, the collective kind of thing. Mm. Apparently, we, we inadvertently made the first Brexit movie with The World's End um, <laughs> pre-Brexit. Somebody told us this the other day um, that we, we, in Gary King, sort of eschewing the, 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 the galactic EU, as it were, Um, and sending the country into Armageddon. Um, how prophetic that was. Uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a complete coincidence that we had the, the Cornettos as a link, but I'm, I've had a lot of ice cream as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your cause. Thank you. Lovely lady here. Um, so we're at Comic-Con. We're all a little bit nerdy. 
So what would you say is the nerdiest thing you earned that you're a little bit embarrassed about? Me? Oh my yep. God. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not embarrassed about anything that I own that's nerdy. I, I wear it with pride. I do have Uncar Plot's nose in a metal box. No, in a glass box. Uh, but that's something that I'm not, I'm very proud of. What do I have that's that nerdy? I think I have like a pair of goggles that were worn in The Empire Strikes Back uh, on Hoth. And they're really ratty and stinky. And, and just the only thing that makes them worthwhile is the fact that some poor, cold extra wore them in The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> and I still have them somewhere. So it's probably that. Fair enough. Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Hello, over here. Hi there. Um, hi, Simon. Buddy. Hi. Uh, I'm just going to read this very quickly because I have a crap memory. Okay. But then I'll be polite and make human eye contact. And you got it. Um, so I'm another film student. Uh, and everything's done... Everything's been done before, so they tell us at uni. And I was wondering, as a writer and actor, how you go about taking something that's been done to death, zombie films, buddy cop dramas, alien invasions, and to an extent, Star Trek, and reinvent it as, make it fresh, funny, and relevant, whilst also being subversive of like the cliches that are obvious in the genre. I think it's always important if you're gonna use nostalgia or recycle something or reboot something, to make sure that it reflects the epoch whence it is now emerging, you know? So, so you, with Shaun of the Dead, um, you know, we took George Romero's world, you know, and, and very brazenly we, we sort of stole his idea and, and said so in the title of the movie. But we said certain things about modern living and, uh, you know, living in London. We used his kind of palette to say something slightly different at least, even though we were essentially making a zombie film. I think it's okay to, to, to recycle ideas as long as you invest them with some kind of point. You know, if it's just for the sake of nostalgia, there are some films now, mentioning no names, uh, that just rely on the fact that, oh, I recognize that. I saw that once in another film when I was 10, and as such, expect that to have some kind of artistic credibility or weight, and it doesn't. It's just cynical recycling, you know? But there's nothing wrong with doing things again if you feel you can bring them something new. And, um, you know, because they were, a good idea is a good idea forever. So um, there's no reason why something that's known can't be fresh again, you know. Um, for, for Edgar and I, it was all about things that we'd loved as children that we wanted to kind of um, have a go at ourselves. A zombie film, a, an action movie, and a sort of social science fiction. So... Um, yeah, I don't think, I think it's wrong to sort of de bemoan rebooting if the rebooting is done with some kind of, you know, point. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, last question. Good luck with your memory. Over here, please. Hi, Simon. Hello. Um, so you've done a bit of everything, like acting, writing, directing, and I'm... Roofing. <laughs> Um, and I'm also a film student, and I really don't know what area to go into. What advice would you give me to, like, narrow it down? Um, I would start working in film uh, as an AD or something like that. Um, try and get yourself as, uh, you know, sort of uh, intern work or something at a production company. Just get into that world and start looking around you at the kind of thing you'd like to do, whether that be directing or producing or whatever, production design. There are so many jobs within the film and television industry which you never hear about when you're at school. You never hear that in your career's thing that you can be like a DOP or a, you know, a, a chippy on the set of a film, you know, specifically for making uh, 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 sets. You never get told that. Um, and it's not until you get in amongst that world that you can start to kind of pick out the jobs that you like to do. So, you know, if you can, write a shit ton of letters to production companies, get out there, have some practical experience and start looking at what looks the most fun to you. You know, find the thing that you love doing the most and then get paid for it. That's the best advice I was ever given. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Well, that's really good advice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry, sorry if I didn't get to answer your question. Sorry we've run out of time. I'm very, very sorry. But, Simon, you've been absolutely wonderful. I think that's a nice way to end it as well. Some safe... Calling me wonderful, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that, obviously, as well. <laughs> Simon, it's been absolutely lovely. You're going to be signing more autographs and things like that. Yeah, I'm doing some pictures as well. Doing some pictures. So yep. if you do have another question from Simon, you can always meet him later. Absolutely, yeah. Ask me at the, the, the signing place or the, or the picture room. So can we have... A huge round of applause for the wonderful Simon Pegg. Oh,